Hi, Lisa. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Been a busy day, but I'm sure you can relate to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Every day. Every day is a busy day. <laughs> well, you and your press are getting pretty daggone famous. A lot of good press. But just in case there's somebody in the audience that really doesn't know much about you, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I'm Lisa Diane Kastner. I'm the founder and executive editor of Running Wild and Rise Presses. Mm -hmm. And at Running Wild, we publish uh, great stories that don't fit neatly in a box. And at Rise, we publish uh, great genre stories uh, written by people of color and other underrepresented groups. Uh, cool. I'm a coffee hound. <laughs> I don't blame you, man. I don't blame you. <laughs> Where's your cat at? Oh, she, I don't know where she is. Uh, <laughs> we had some uh, construction-y type stuff going on earlier today, so she might be hiding. Oh. <laughs> well, if you are comfortable doing so, we'll just jump right into the questions that I uh, think a lot of writers would like to like to approach. So can we sure. go? Okay. Well, the yeah. first one's pretty simple. But I couldn't begin to answer it, but I know you can. <laughs> I hope so. We'll find out. <laughs> All right. So what inspired you to become a publisher? Uh, so believe it or not, um, this all began on my first date with my husband. Wow. And um, I've been in the writing world for, gosh, uh, let's just say far too long. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I knew a lot of people who were just amazing storytellers. I mean, they really, really wrote fantastic stories and they couldn't get published. I mean, they sent their stuff out everywhere. And for whatever reason, they, you know, just either were told, you know, it's not the right time or, you know, this isn't quite the right fit from agents, from uh, editors, from publishing houses, you name it. So literally on my first date with my, again, now husband, I was uh, telling him about this and he, he's a, an, a, a musician and a producer. And his comment to me was, well, why don't you just start your own house? And I literally said to him, like, I can do that. Like, that's a thing. <laughs> and uh, his response to me was, why not? I mean, that's what we do in music. Why can't you do it in 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 storytelling and in, in book publishing? Mm -hmm. So I um, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So I then spent the next, I want to say, two, three years basically going around to different conferences. And I would, in essence, corner uh, agents and editors from like bigger and mid-sized houses. And I basically offer them a glass of wine or whatever their favorite beverage of, uh, was at the time. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I'd chat, we'd just chat. And in that I'd ask them, like, how do you decide what stories you're going to acquire and what ones, you know, you're not going to even look at. And uh, there was a common theme about how books uh, are acquired. And I realized that there was a major gap in how uh, stories were, were being uh, acquired and put out on the shelves, which means there are all these amazing stories that are being left on the table. Uh -huh. So uh, with that, I then uh, started actually running wild. So... Yeah, that, that's how it all started. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool, though. And yeah. did you have a, a background uh, working for a publishing house or as an agent? Or did you just jump into this career, you know, say your previous job was teaching, you know, mm -hmm. and you jump into this career and just, just went for it? <laughs> uh, so I, uh, my background was more in, like, journalism corporate communications, uh, tech program management, uh, portfolio management. Um, like I, I had, I actually, first I had one career in more like journalism and corporate uh, communications. And I had won a bunch of awards there. And uh, I realized that 
uh, I get bored, to be honest, I get bored easily. Like if I conquer mm-hmm. something, then I'm like, okay, what else can I conquer? Right. <laughs> so, uh, I won some, uh, a lot, a bunch of awards and, you know, even when I was in grad school, I have a, an MFA in creative writing and an MBA, mm-hmm. um, in business administration. And, um, in, for my MBA, MBA, I actually, uh, uh, I did a bunch of research that was then used in one of my professor's uh, uh, books, mm-hmm. and I uh, received scholarships uh, for both my MBA and for my undergraduate. Actually, yeah. And um, so, you know, there comes a point where you're like, okay, I really want to be challenged. And I had a client who said, um, wow, you're really good at business uh communications and like marketing and stuff, but you are also really good at tech. So he said, why don't you try uh, something in more like the tech sector? And then, so then I switched my career to be a very like tech focused. Mm -hmm. Uh, So pro technology program management and, and um, really focused on doing transformations for businesses, stuff like that. Wow. And, um, Along, all along the way, though, I kept writing. Like, I still wrote short stories. I still, uh, the first book uh, I wrote was absolutely horrid. And I am so thankful to my then uh, sister-in-law, who was incredibly generous. And when I asked her if she'd read it, she did. And it was one of those that, like, I just did it like a, a free flow, right? Like, I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote until I got to an end. And it was some one of those like it started off as a mystery and somehow became like something completely different by the end. And there was no real narrative thread. There was no, you know, it was, it was a hot mess to put it lightly. So um, I I can't say I can't say that I like work for a publishing house. I did a lot of research. I'm a research hound. Um, I because the more knowledge you have, I think the more the better you are. And, um, you know, uh, so, you know, I just I went around and, and did a bunch of research and interviewed a bunch of people and found out like how they were doing things and, um, tried to learn from the things that they found beneficial as well as the their challenges that they had. Mm-hmm. And, uh, from there, we just, uh, we did a proof of concept on a book that I actually wrote mm-hmm. and, um, just to see like, okay, When you go online, it sounds so easy, right? Uh, Like when you listen to like a lot of Mm self-publishers and a lot of, um, I can't say a lot of uh, independent presses, some, um, but, you know, they make it a lot of the, actually more so the platforms that offer independent publishers an opportunity, they make it sound easy. Like, look, you just click the button and boom, now all of a sudden you're public. (laughs) And the whole world knows you and you're on USA Today's bestseller list and you're enormous and we can get you there. Just give us $50,000 or something, (laughs) right? And uh, I was like, okay, uh, it can't be that easy because if it was that easy, then there would be far more uh, huge bestsellers who are like, you would see Neil Gaiman saying, screw this. I'm going to go and do self-publishing because I can do do better on my own, right? <laughs> and that, that hasn't happened, right? And it hasn't happened for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so we did that. That was actually how we started Running Wild. And because um, I figured I'd rather test on myself uh-huh. than have someone else do it. And uh, we learned a lot from it. So really, it was a lot of just um, research and you know, networking and, you know, trial and error. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it surprises me that it sounds so much like, well, I've been in, I've owned five companies in different industries. Mm-hmm. But the basic business effort is true of all industries. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You have certain things you need to cover and things you need to know. And like you said, a lot of research. And I don't, I don't believe anyone should stop learning. I mean, always, always be trying to learn something. (laughs) And, uh, but, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm a lifetime entrepreneur. 
Mm-hmm. But if I wanted to start a publishing house tomorrow, I wouldn't have a clue. I would spend mm-hmm. at least a year just trying to learn how to do it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but I won't even aspire to be a an editor. Uh, I've been in contact with a couple of editors, and they do see things that I miss. And mm-hmm. you know, I think I'm a halfway decent writer, but boy, editors are a league of their own, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and it's very impressive. You've got some excellent editors on your staff. Uh, I've met Ben. I've heard about uh, Cody Cisco. Boy, David Fitzpatrick really bragged about him a lot. And oh yeah, you've got several other. I, I wouldn't even got about seven editors that you uh, work with on a regular basis. Uh, I want to say, because we're still recruiting editors, um, mm-hmm. I want to say we probably have around 12 now, something wow. like that. Wow, cool. Uh, but yeah, all are on a contract basis. And uh, mm-hmm. don't forget to mention Peter Wright. Pete is uh-huh. absolutely amazing. Um, he uh, is one. He's one of those editors that really pushes the author to get outside their comfort zones. Uh-huh. And um, he ha- he's had at least one book that's been named one of the best of the year by Kirkus. Wow. And uh, that, that he edited. And he's had a few that, you know, got starred reviews and, or like just truly fantastic reviews. So, yeah, I mean, we're really blessed to have some amazing acquisition editors and editors on our team. Very cool. So when you were trying to bring Running Wild Press into existence, what would you say was the biggest hurdle that you faced in either being taken seriously or the mechanics of opening a press? Uh, Actually, I'd say my own insecurity. Really? Uh, So similar to what you you mentioned about, you know, like I had considered um, really diving into why so many people I knew who were great writers just, you know, they were lucky if they could have their corner, uh, you know, magazine print them. Uh-huh. And um, I never considered myself an editor. Well, I mean, I, I uh, even in, you know, for, for my, day, my day job, right, when I was doing more journalism and, uh-huh. you know, uh, more like corporate communications and, and, you know, transformation communications, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I, I know how to edit AP style, right? And, but I didn't have a clue. I mean, I was terrified at the idea of editing someone else's work. Cause like, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. Right. Like, what if I make a suggestion and, you know, it turns out it's completely off base as to what the author had in mind, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, I just, I really, like, I, I never, ever, 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 before, before starting Running Wild, um, I never e- even considered being an editor. Mm. And the, I'd say the first, like, uh, what I would consider to be, like, fiction, more, like, narrative structured mm-hmm. uh, editing I did was actually... Uh, the short first short story anthology that we put out Mm -hmm. and um you know I think that getting like I said it it was really fear right it was getting out of my own way and and honestly uh the support of my husband and 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 a lot of my good friends that I made by going to different conferences and workshops and I tossed out there hey look I'm going to do this Mm -hmm. and they were like oh hell yeah like you need to do this, and I and I I was actually really surprised because I didn't think anybody considered me as an editor, right? And um and so I thought, all right, well, now mind you, these were all people I met in conferences and workshops, which means I had already given them feedback. Mm-hmm. I had already edited their work in some way, uh-huh. and and because at the time, and I, I apologize if you can hear that. Uh, someone's car alarm's going off. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, a lot of, I, I didn't understand what an acquisition editor did and I didn't really understand what a fiction editor did, right? I, uh, I just knew what I found valuable when someone was going over my work and when they gave me feedback. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I mean, um, and, and mind you, I did ask, right? It wasn't mm-hmm. like I, like, met with these, you know, big house editors and, and uh-huh. didn't ask them, like, what, what do you do, right? 
Yeah. And, um, you know, the most valuable uh, feedback I got was uh, I pretend I'm the reader and I figure out what the reader would want when they're, you know, reading this new work. And I base my feedback on that. And I, I was like, oh my God. Yeah, that that's it. Right. That's <laughs> really what, and, and I'm not going to say this is a, 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 the role of an editor across all different uh, storytelling styles or different writing styles, but I'd say for like fiction and memoir, that's yeah. really what an editor's job is. You know, yeah. it's to pretend to be, to have, an, have enough in-depth knowledge of the craft of writing and narrative that they can then take 10 or 100 steps back and look at the work and say, okay, um, if I'm a reader, what do I want when I'm reading this, right? What am I looking for? And um, anyway, so yeah, it was getting over insecurities like that, right? And like, who the hell am I to start a, a press, right? <laughs> like, dare I do something like this? And it was interesting because all along the way, every time I thought, uh, well, this was a bad idea idea <laughs> or or what am I doing like this is insane you know or you know how do I eat? like I think this is now a great piece of work and and you know how do how maybe I should just close just close up shop right because mm -hmm. you know this just isn't working out the way I thought it was every time like I'd say literally within 24 to 48 hours Mm -hmm. Either we got some kind of fan mail that was so insane. I I mean, it like put me to tears or we won some huge uh, accolade, like, you know, best of the year by Kirkus. You oh. know what I mean? Like it uh -huh. was just every single time. And, and so that's, it just told me like, all right, so this is all in your head. Like this insecurity, oh. right? All of these obstacles are they're just in my head and I need to get over it you know and I need to really pay attention to what uh readers are saying and what fans are saying and uh what the market's saying and and just keep driving forward yeah so I, think I hope I answered very... your question <laughs> <laughs> I think actually you make a very valid point that anybody in the audience should pay attention to it, particularly writers or aspiring editors. Uh, I can speak more from an entrepreneurial background, but I would say any entrepreneur in any industry will tell you your worst enemy is self-doubt. Mm -hmm. You've got to go for it. You take and corral all your skills. You sharpen them up the best you can. You collaborate with people who have skills you don't have and mm -hmm. go for it. Uh, self-doubt can cripple you. And you make a valid point. I don't think Running Wild Press would exist if you didn't have the courage to overcome that self-doubt, that self-doubt, you know. And, and, and I, and I, to your point, that's every, everybody, like no matter if you, if some, if whoever's watching, if you, if you're pondering something that you're like, oh, I've always wanted to X, mm -hmm. stop it. Right. I mean, do it mm -hmm. intelligently. I'm not saying go out and get a loan for like a half million dollars and yeah. then start you know, open your own mall, but, mm -hmm. you know, you do your homework, do your research and, and be smart about it. Interview people that, you know, were successful mm -hmm. and then, and then do it right. Yeah. Just get out of your own way, you know, yeah. make that path to whatever it is that you want to do as painless as possible. Cause uh -huh. you're going to have pain anyway, right? There's uh -huh. always, you're always going to fail in some capacity, which is really just a way to learn. Yeah. And, it's really in my, you know, to me, that's, it's positive, right? Because uh -huh. things that happen, you know, the more you learn, uh, yeah. it kind of helps you get back on whatever path, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, don't, yeah, just get out of your own way, do it, make it happen, you know? Uh -huh. Well, I would like to ask you, it's been, I think, six, seven years that you've been running Running Wild Press, is that right? Uh, yeah, we incorporated on uh, June of 2016. Okay. Now, that's, that's a few years, and you've learned a lot. You've grown, got a lot of great authors. Mm -hmm. Today, what would you say is the biggest hurdle you face? What's the biggest challenge when you go into the office to do your job? You know, are you having more trouble with, say, 
the production side of things or author's expectations or, you know, some other part of the business? What, what would you say is your biggest challenge today? Uh, so I'd say our biggest challenge today is uh, in order to get uh, our books on like, let's say an end cap at Barnes and Noble, uh-huh. whether people realize this or not, you've got to pay for it. Mm. Like, I mean, they're not just doing it because they're like, wow, this is a great book. They're doing it because you said, look, I'm investing $15,000 uh-huh. in marketing. And on top of that, I'll give you another whatever amount they declare. Uh-huh. Right. And I mean, that's, you know, something that I think a lot of people don't realize uh, so much of this. I mean, there's so much noise. There's so much stuff out there today. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, you, you always hear about the guy who, you know, uh, put this uh, like a first timer, put his book out and it's sold in the millions. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like 0.01 percent. Right. Mm-hmm. There's some statistic that uh, there's only like, I want to say 4%, something insane like that, of all uh, books sell over 5,000 copies. Wow. Then that's both print and uh, ebook. Now I need to look it up because it's going to bug me. <laughs> uh, and if you think about that, the ra- what that means is, Oh, 98% of books released in 2020 sold less than 5,000 copies. Wow. Wow. And so what that means is the majority of books out there are not making enough money to actually cover base costs. Yeah. And and this is talking from someone that like, we're fully digital, right? Like we don't have yeah. an office space. Everyone works from home. Yeah. You know, we've, we've got everything set up. So everything that we do behind the scenes is online. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we're very echo friendly in that manner. Yeah. Um, the overhead down as far as right. possible. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And the majority from a business perspective, the majority of the people who work for us either work on a contract basis mm-hmm. or are volunteering basically. Right. Yeah. Um, we really only have two employees and they're based out of, um, uh, the Philippines. Mm-hmm. So, and it's because it's it's a way to keep all of our our base operational costs down. Yeah, you know, yeah, so that can manage. Yeah, because I mean, if you had, especially with a small press, I would think, you know, if you get a little carried away with yourself and you go into one of the best neighborhoods of your city, open a fancy office, hire a couple of secretaries or personal assistants to make sure your dry cleaning is done. You know, now now your authors come to your press and you got to sell their book for eighty dollars to to make anything. You know, <laughs> and nobody's right. gonna buy that book for eighty dollars. You know, <laughs> no and, one's gonna buy that book. Yeah, I would suggest to any writer, there's a whole bunch of industries out there to go chase a buck. I think that writing should be a creative adventure, and you know, if you make a buck, great. If you're one of those two percent or four percent, hooray! But it's not that different, in my opinion, from being a, a painter or a sculptor. Bring your well, work to life. Create. If the money comes, wonderful, but don't base it on the money, because then you're going to be really disappointed. Would you agree with that? Well, I think you need to decide on what you want to be, mm-hmm. right? And that's one thing, like, I teach a lot of workshops, and I, I speak at a lot of conferences, and... You know, one thing I really advocate is you need to figure out what your mission statement is, mm-hmm. you as an author. Like, who do you want to be when you grow up? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then once you figure that out, then you just, you you know, do it's the same thing. You do your research, you find out how did so-and-so get to this point, right? Mm-hmm. And you're going to quickly find out that, like, a lot of the authors who are doing really, really well, and like this is their full-time job, they're doing it with intent. Like they've done their homework. They have understood. So what makes a great thriller? What makes a great horror book? Yeah. What makes a great, you know, mystery? Uh-huh. And they intentionally wrote within the genres that they knew would sell really well. Mm-hmm. And they intentionally, you know, wrote um, stories that they knew 
based on, you know, possibly being a super fan themselves mm -hmm. would sell. Uh -huh. So it's not a, you know, you, you, you know, if, if, if you, if you're going after being an author and um, you're going to do it as more of art to your point, don't expect that you're going to sell in the millions, mm -hmm. right? Like it would be fabulous. Mm -hmm. Like who doesn't want to win a national book award? I would love yeah. to, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's the reality of, well, how well does that actually sell? And, uh -huh. you know, all the behind the scenes, like networking and connections that you need to make so that you're even someone that so would be, could be considered uh -huh. for something of that acclaim, right? I mean, there's so many, it's so uh it's like a spider web of all these different things that you know connect to get you to a point where you can be of that esteem mm. so you know again it's just you got to figure out like who do you want to be when you grow up and then and develop that path so that you can be successful in it it makes a lot of sense yeah well just out of quick curiosity what was the first book published under running wild press and did it do okay um, it was uh, Jersey Diner, which was a first-person narrative that I wrote over several years, uh, yeah. a relatively small fiction book, uh, more, I would say more like literary commercial fiction. Mm -hmm. um, it did okay. Um, I think we sold a couple of hundred copies, and that was with hiring a publicist. Wow. So... Uh, now, and I, I actually did have, I mean, I wasn't like super well-known um, uh -huh. in social media or anything like that at the time. Um, so, so considering that, you know, uh, that was pretty impressive, but uh -huh. yeah, it, it did okay. It didn't do great. It did, uh -huh. it did fine. Mm -hmm. But that, that helps an author and the audience realize if you're unknown, this is your first work, try to have realistic expectations, you know? If Lisa Kastner sold 500 books, how far ahead is she in her career and where is she and how well is she known compared to where you are? A good example is myself. I'm pretty much nobody, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I put out a little teeny tiny book just to see if I could, you mm -hmm. know, and I think it's been a month and I, you know, I've sold 20 copies. I'm thrilled. You know, I didn't expect it to make a lot of money. I just wanted to see what would happen, you know, <laughs> but realistic yeah. expectations, I think are very important. Yeah, I mean, and if you look at like the, there's an independent author, Scott Siegler, who he sells in the millions, right? Wow. But he, his turnout, like he, I think he publishes like a novel. I want to say it's like a novel a month or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's because he knew he he writes in the same universe all the time, right? It's uh, all the stories are interwoven. Uh -huh. And it's almost like he has an interplay with his uh, his readers where they give him suggestions and he's like, oh, wow, that's a really good idea. Oh, let me try that out. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's not all that way. Uh -huh. But to your point, he's got a, he has a massive following because he has this relationship yeah. with his fans, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and just another aside, uh, recently I read an article by this huge marketing, book marketing guru, mm -hmm. and she said, uh, you know, people always ask her, like, what's the best thing you can do? What can, you know, for, uh, you know, really selling mass quantities? And she said, uh, figure you're going to sell larger quantities by the time you hit your third book. Oh, and she said, because really your first and second books, those are you're 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 building up a following. Uh -huh. So you're getting from the first and second books, you know, you've got your website, you're now, you know, hopefully you're now uh, you, you've got more of a following, you've got more press, you know, publicity, the, the today's market. It's all about the brand of you, meaning the brand of the author. Oh. It's not about the actual book itself necessarily, right? But there, once you've developed a brand around you, then, you know, you get a greater following because there's this expectation that comes with it. And oftentimes you don't really develop that following until like the third book. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the businesses I owned was a construction company. 
And you struggle to get those first few jobs. But then word of mouth gets around that, wow, this guy built this really great. And in a year or two on your fifth house, all of a sudden you've got more orders than you can possibly fill. You know, <laughs> I mean, I've experienced that firsthand, you know, that build it, getting known. I guess that's obviously I believe in that. You know, this show <laughs> is a part of my author platform uh, I'm on social media, a couple of different social medias. And I'm, you know, when I started, when I began my novel, Rod Gilly Who, nobody knew who I was, you know, and, and I'm not super well known now, but, you know, something in the neighborhood with the writer friends I have who have a great habit of retweeting things that I tweet, for example, you know, probably 20,000 people see everything that I put on the internet. And that's nice. not for a nobody a year ago, you know? <laughs> Those are great numbers. Yeah, Those that's are fabulous. Bad. Yeah. But, uh, again, it comes back to you've got to go for it. You've got to get over self-doubt. You know, I'm not a very handsome man. I'm not an expert of anything. But the only way I'm going to succeed is if I say, okay, I'm going for it. You know? <laughs> yeah. you know? That, that's everybody, right? You just got to get out of your own way. Yep. <laughs> Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is in the press I've been able to find and read about Running Wild Press, it pretty much burst onto the scene commanding respect and success. You're past the dreaded five-year mark. A lot of businesses don't make it past five years. You've got a sustainable business. Where do you see, it, see Running Wild Press and Rise in the next five years maybe 10 years where what do you what do you see out in the future where are you headed uh, well i think we're still definitely in growth mode mm -hmm. um we are we're right i'd say we're in the that's you know there's a stage where you have like a really small 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 tiny meaning like you and if you're lucky one other person uh -huh. right your family <laughs> behind the scenes and we're at a point where we've probably got, I'd say, closer to 18 to 20 people, including guys who, like, they work on a contract basis. Yeah. Um, so we're in the middle of really operationalizing things so that it, it works as, as smoothly as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, right now we're also in the middle of looking for uh, investors, so venture capitalists who can help us. Because as you know, right from being an entrepreneur, uh -huh. each stage has its own growing pain, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that growing pain, it, you know, depending on where you are, it can be pretty significant. And so, uh, you know, for us, really getting investors involved and, and uh, getting them engaged, I think, would really help us, you know, take that leap next level. Uh -huh. Um. But to your point around uh, where, do, where do I see us in five to 10 years? In five years, uh, we see ourselves as really being much more, uh, again, really stable, um, operational. Every year we blow our, our target numbers out of the water, which is amazing, right? It's, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. so fingers crossed where we continue doing that. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that we're not doing, that we're not intentional in what we do. We're very intentional. Uh, we look at what's worked, what hasn't. And then decide on, you know, where are we going to invest our energies in the upcoming year and like adjust uh, our, what our plans are based on that, on all those learnings. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, go, usually it's uh, minimally once a year, sometimes twice a year, uh, myself and my team, uh, leadership team, we get together and we figure out, okay, what does this look like? What does it mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but in five years, uh, you know, fully operational where we're, uh, we've got more, uh, full-time staff. Mm -hmm. Um, our books are being, um, uh, you'll find them on the, as the, on the, the end cap for Barnes and Noble, right. Uh, you'll see them in, in target. You'll, uh, they'll be everywhere and uh, we'll continue winning awards and continue, uh, getting that, you know, that acclaim, um, we'll be in your favorite libraries, uh, not that we're not now, but, you know, even more so. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one of the things that I always believed and I continue to believe is that, you know, in reality, this is all about the fan. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, fans want a few things. One, they want stories that reflect them, right? They want stories that they can relate to. Yeah. And two, they want their stories wherever they are. Uh-huh. So they, it doesn't have to be a book, but it could be a comic book. It could be an audio book. It could mm-hmm. be uh, in translation. It could be a TV show. It could be film. It could be an online uh, comic book, which uh, the, the best known company for that is actually called Webtoon. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be in any of these spaces. And so our goal is really between that five and 10 year mark, if not sooner, is ensuring that our stories are everywhere that our possible fans could be. And so it's really beefing up our licensing aspects associated uh-huh. with that. Um, so, but because of that, because of that, uh, that's really our goal, right? Is that our fans are where our stories are wherever our fans are. Um, it's, uh, I think we'll get acquired uh, again between the five and 10 year mark and most likely by um, more of like a Netflix or a an Amazon Studios or something like that. Uh-huh. Because if you look at their business models and the stories they're putting out there, they seem to be much more uh, in tune with their customer base uh-huh. and understand uh, what their customers are looking for. And they're taking chances on those things that maybe, you know, you wouldn't have seen before and they're seeing a return on it. So I, I really, I think it'll be something like that. Someone who understands the market much better than the, uh-huh. the old school publishing uh, model, uh-huh. if that, if that makes sense. So. Well, some of that I'll admit is over my head. I'm pretty small time, but um, I can relate to it to a degree. Is that it would be with a company that has a broader reach Uh in terms of um, not just distribution, but also like marketing and publicity. And so we can, we can uh, augment each other, right? Which would be the whole point, right? Is that the purpose of the partnership? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what I've heard about it, for example, Shea Galloway's The Valley of Sage and Juniper. I could actually see that being like a Netflix miniseries. I mean, oh, yeah. we could go there. And so that might be a, a good, let's call it a merger with Running Wild and Netflix, you know, uh, mm-hmm. or, or any company like Netflix. I mean, I can see you pointing in that direction. It could be very beneficial all the way around could, to the audience to readers, to the authors, and hopefully you would do well also, you know, (laughs) know, I'm I'm a believer, the most successful company I ever owned, I started it with $100 and a sheet of typing paper, Nice sheet of typing paper I used to brainstorm the name of the company, the $100 I bought a good saw, back then you could, and I went to work and I actually found very good success in that business, you know, and, uh, so I'm a believer, you know, but from what I've seen and heard from several, several of your authors already, mm-hmm. wow, there's a wealth of talent, creativity, drive, everything you need. You know, David Fitzpatrick is uh, going to come out with Wolf Boy. Mm-hmm. And please forgive me if I don't get it right, because I rarely do. It's L-G-B-Q okay. plus is uh-huh. right. You know, yep. is part of his story. Is part of his story has to do with that. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he described his story to me, and it is so gripping and so real. 1979, being a teenager, I was there. Mm-hmm. I was a teen in 1979, mm-hmm. and it would be so easy. We were stupid. We did drugs. We partied. We did all kinds of crazy things. <laughs> It would be so easy to find yourself in an incredibly embarrassing situation. And David Fitzpatrick really hit that. And and I look for his novel to be extremely successful because I think everyone can relate to it. It doesn't matter what your personal preferences are, what color your skin is. Any human being will connect to that story. I really believe that. You know, and with the the wealth of intelligent, driven, talented writers that are associated with running wild press, you know, in time, and I don't think it'll take you 10 years, mm. in time, you, you'll you be comparing bids. You'll be like, well, I don't know, Amazon offered us this, you know, Netflix offered us, I don't know which one I like better, 
you know, seven figures sounds good, but you know, they ought to get us that little cottage in Malibu, you know. <laughs> you never know. I'm a firm yeah. believer in shoot for the stars. Yeah. Well, you land well on a mountain, you. you got pretty far, right? <laughs> We've got so much amazing talent behind the scenes oh, yeah. as well as in front of that um, you know, and and I think one of our our superpowers is really just staying open minded and and saying, Okay, you know, shoot hit me up, what's your idea, right? And then yeah. really kind of brainstorming out, like, well, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, like, we've had a couple of ideas from a, um, an, like an acquisition, meaning like the stories uh, where, like we had one but one memoir that was written. I think they wrote it, if I remember correctly, in a, a, a third person, a third person close. Mm -hmm. And we were like, you know what? If you rewrote this in a first person narrative mm -hmm. and stuck to this key, like this key storyline, if you consider revising it with that, we would love to to look at that. Yeah. And we've had some authors who said, Oh, wow, you know what? I think you're right. We've had other authors when we came back with, you know, suggestions like that, who turned around and said, you know, stuck up their middle finger and said, Screw you. And I was sure. like, Hey, all good. You know, it doesn't yeah. mean right. It just means that, mm -hmm. you know, when we and you know, if it's something where one person comes back with that thought, like this would be so much more gripping if whatever or you know what whatever it might be, uh -huh. then that's nothing. But if you've got like two or three people who are all well versed in storytelling and the, the craft of storytelling, and they're all coming back with the same feedback. Then that's something where you kind of go, go say, you know what, maybe why don't we give this suggestion, you know, and, um, and we've been blessed to have uh, a lot of authors who, when we, you know, sat down and to talk to them about like, Hey, here's some potentials. They mm -hmm. were like, Oh my God, you're right. That's mm -hmm. yeah, let's do it. You know? So, mm -hmm. um, and, and again, we're never dictatorial. That That's one of my pet peeves, you know, is, uh, we ask the, the authors to be open-minded when we give feedback. Mm -hmm. And one of the dictates I have to my uh, editors is, you know, it's never really a tell, right? Mm -hmm. It's always, uh, we're asking you, hey, I noticed this. Um, what are, it's not quite, you know, working. What are you trying to accomplish in this mm -hmm. section and why? Yeah. And you know, a lot of times the author, they've thought through it, right? They've done a lot of work and they just may not realize that that portion isn't working, you know, or they got feedback early on. And so this was their way of addressing that feedback. And so it's kind of, it's working through it with the author to either to figure out how to make this, what it, uh, the, the fantastic story it's meant to be. Yeah. So, Yeah. Well, I can say, uh, as a writer myself, I've touched base with a couple of editors. I don't yet have a long-term thing going. I, I hope to. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the touching base that I did, I realized, and it shocked me, I'm sure it would surprise a lot of writers, that I wrote this. I know every word in it. And the editors come back to me. Uh, I'll even name Ben White is brilliant. Mm -hmm. He'll come back to me, and I've teased him about his red pen a little bit. But uh, I looked at his red pen. I listened to his suggestions. I kept an open mind. And, wow, I didn't know that was there. Or, wow, I didn't know that was missing. How did I miss that? Mm -hmm. and, and Ben saw it, you know. And a writer, I believe, just has to be open to that. You, you, you know, you mentioned a memoir in my tiny little world, and I'll grant you it's a tiny little world. Mm -hmm. Every memoir I've ever read has been written in first person. To me, I, said, I would, if I wanted to write a memoir, it would be in first person. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that common or is that not so much? I, I'd say most memoirs are in first person. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think so. That should have been an easy sell to the writer, was it? Uh, no, the writer, uh, just tacitly rejected it because, uh, he was trying to, he was trying to say it was nonfiction uh -huh. 
And when we were, we basically came back and said, well, it's your story, right? Uh, and, and it was like, well, yeah, it's my story. Uh, and it's these other people's stories. It's like, but a memoir is your story and those that you're engaged in or engaged with. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and he, no, he felt like he was doing something groundbreaking. And he didn't realize that uh, it wasn't quite working. Now yeah. that said, you know, he may have at this point found another uh, publisher who said, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm all in. And that's fabulous. I think it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. That's actually a question we get a lot is like, have you ever had a, have you ever rejected a story that got picked up elsewhere? Well, of course, mm -hmm. we only yeah. publish 10 to 15 stories per press. So that's 20 to 30 mm -hmm. per, per in total per year. Mm -hmm. And there are thousands and thousands, if not millions of books that are published per year. Mm -hmm. So of course, we're not going to pick up everything that's, you know, sent yeah. to us. So. I've been, you know, told by in, in conversations with other writers that even some of our most famous authors, you know, had some of their stories passed on. You know, they just didn't pay. It didn't feel like a fit. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I've passed on contracts in other industries. I, it just didn't feel like something I either could do as well as I want to do. If I'm going to put my name on it, it's got to be as close to perfect as possible. Mm -hmm. and if I didn't feel I had the skills, I passed, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that a writer has to think that way, too, is, you know, yeah, it's really wonderful that you think you've done something groundbreaking. But let's be honest, every story has been told at this point. Mm -hmm. I think the best an author can hope for is to put their own heart and their own personality and their own spin and take that story and, and make it new and how you tell it. Would mm -hmm. you say that's pretty true? Or am I way off base on that? I very well could be. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it just, because uh, I, I, I would never, never claim to have read everything that's available out there. So mm -hmm. I I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I've read and I know what I've studied and uh, that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, you know, I think there's always an opportunity to tell a great story. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I have learned what I, you know, I'm a pantser, and I'm pretty famous for saying my characters are doing this. I'm typing for 40 words a minute just trying to keep up with them, you know, and uh, I think I got this really great story, and then I hit the uh, beta readers, well, my alpha reader, beta readers, touch base with a couple of editors, and then I realized, Rod, you wrote a whole bunch of gibberish. Well, now's when it's time to go to work. Listen to your editor. Listen mm -hmm. to the feedback that you're getting and go to work. And I think sometimes people forget 1940, 1950, 2023. If you want it, you got to work for it. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. I don't, I don't think anything falls right into somebody's lap nowadays. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh -oh. I, was, uh, I was listening to a podcast that was talking about you know, if you look at all of like the the athletes who are Hall of Famers, mm -hmm. you know, they fail. They only succeeded 30 percent of the time on average. Mm -hmm. So that means they failed 70 percent of the time. And that's a Hall of Famer that, you know, this is the, the cream of the crop. Yeah. And, you know, that tells you that we all are all constantly learning. Right. Yeah. And the only way you learn is by, you know, doing it and then yeah. saying, okay, well, that didn't work. Uh, what else? You know, what can mm -hmm. I learn from this and how can I make this a success and, and how do I keep driving forward? So, yeah. Yeah. I say all the time, never give up. Uh, that's something mm -hmm. I learned early that I have never forgotten. And I tell everyone, anyone that's willing to listen, you know, what's your secret to success? Never give up. You're going to fail. You're going to stumble. You're going to make mistakes. Sometimes things are going to backfire. Mm -hmm. keep, keep going for it you know the only way to truly fail is to not try you right know? exactly and you, even when you find success it may look different than what you had in mind you know mm -hmm. but you will fail if you don't mm -hmm. work <laughs> I mean, if you think about all the times that you were afraid to do something or someone suggested hey why don't you do x and you didn't do it out of fear mm -hmm. right and then those times when you had that a similar fear and you went, okay, you know, told that inner voice, no, I'm going to do it. And you went ahead and did it. 
And you were like, oh my God, that was amazing. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> it's like it, it helps you for each, every time that, that, that little voice of fear comes forward. Cause then it's like, shut up. I've heard <laughs> you before. And now I'm, I'm going to, let, let me try this, you yeah. know, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, you're an acclaimed owner of a small press with the whole future ahead of you. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just keep making it happen. Yep. <laughs> now, I had the good fortune, the privilege of sitting in on one of your live broadcasts. And oh, you cool. covered the subject beautifully. But just in case somebody missed that, we'll touch on it here. Sure. Being a relatively new writer myself, I don't know what to expect. You know, I hear from various other writers, you know, you go get published, you're going to get a $10,000 advance and yeah. the world is going to fall right into your lap, blah, blah, blah. Well, in my little tiny experience, uh, it's not quite going to work that way. So maybe if you would kind of enlighten the new writer who is willing to work but really hasn't got a clue what to expect. What 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 should a writer when he when he's thinking about sending his manuscript or she, they're gonna send the manuscript to you mm -hmm. or any small press. You know, mm -hmm. what's a realistic hope for a new writer? Well, uh I think first figure out back to that whole like who do you want to be when you grow up thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then make sure that you're targeting uh, where you're sending your short stories or novellas or full length works, because so that way you've got a higher likelihood of being accepted, right? So if you're if you're writing uh, more commercial fiction, do your homework, target those places that are accepting commercial fiction. If you're writing romance, same thing. If you're writing for whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. Do your homework, figure out where the, the market is. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Two. Uh, again, you know, read within the genres that you are writing so that you can learn from the best. Yeah. Uh, three, uh, go to conferences, go to book fairs, uh, talk to other, not just writers, but editors and talk to people who are fans of those genres so you uh -huh. can learn, right? Everybody has something that they can bring forward. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like your first, let's say, uh, you know, you, you, you wrote a, a book and you sent it to a press and you get an offer. And um, first thing is to understand where most offers are coming from. So most offers are going to be based on an anticipated sales. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I mean by that is, especially a larger publisher, they're going to look at your book. And there would, they would have done their homework and said, uh, how many stories, how, what, sim, what stories are similar that were published in the last like two years mm -hmm. and how much money did they make? Mm -hmm. And they're going to base their offer to that, to you as a new author uh, mm -hmm. based on that. And they're also going to take into account what kind of following do you have? Um, you know, have you published a story before somewhere else? Mm -hmm. uh, do you get a lot of press, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that, because that enables them to know, um, w get an idea for how much your book is going to sell. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, on top of that, it also helps them understand how much they want to invest. So what I mean by that is, let's say you write, wrote this great book and you get an upfront and advance offer for like $500, mm -hmm. which in all honesty, in my opinion, that's actually pretty good, especially if you're a complete unknown, yeah. you've got no following, you know, nothing, right? Um, and uh, so, like, let's say, uh, it, to be realistic, most houses are going to sit down and they're going to figure out, they'll have a baseline of how much they're going to invest in each author in terms of publicity and, and so on. But the reality is, in today's market, uh, it's all about the brand of the author, right? So, you know, Rod, like you're building this brand by having a relaxing chat, right? Mm -hmm. And you're you're building a network and you're getting to know a, a, a broader scope of individuals, authors and editors and all these different people in the business. Mm 
Yeah. And because of that, right, it's 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 broadening what what a publisher might view as like the value that you're bringing when cool. you come to them with stories, right? Because huh. you now you're building a broader following. Yeah. And, and uh, so a, pr- a publisher is going to look at that and they're going to say, oh, well, let you know, Rod's got, let's say, 50,000 fans. Mm-hmm. Maybe 10% of those fans will buy books. So that's about 5,000. And then, of course, on top of that, you might have, you know, X number of libraries and bookstores and schools and so on that might pick it up. Mm-hmm. So then based on that, they'll know that they're going to at least break even, right? And then they'll they'll make a small, uh, there might be a small percentage. So mm-hmm. at first they're going to do the bare minimum, right? They're going to say, all right, we're, we'll, we'll do reviews and so on. Um, and then based on how it's received in terms of reviews and also like pre-order, mm-hmm. they'll then say, oh, wow. Well, hey, Rod's got, these great reviews and mm-hmm. got this great attention and got all these great blurbs you know what we're going to invest more money now oh. now we're going to put them up for these different awards right and mm-hmm. a, with the expectation that you rod again the brand of the author you're going to keep pushing this right mm-hmm. you're going to put yourself out there you're going to keep talking about your great stories you're going to keep bringing things forward so in today's market you know unlike uh, in, in previous times, which actually I, as I'm saying, and I'm like, I don't know that that's actually true. Cause if you think about it, you know, um, so many of, of, of our past icons are known as they, they themselves like Edgar Allan Poe. When mm-hmm. you think of stories by Edgar Allan Poe, you're thinking of Poe. You're not thinking of necessarily the story first, if yeah. that makes sense. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the reality is that you yourself as a brand and the ex expectation of the publisher is that you're going to keep pushing and leveraging and putting yourself out there to help promote the uh, the brand of of rod which is also going to promote the your stories as well yeah one Uh, of the things that motivated me is uh two years ago i was sitting at my desk alone and i couldn't find a beta reader mm. literally i was alone and the thought crossed my mind that stephen king could write 300 pages literally typing Blah, 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 blah. And that book would sell 100,000 copies. Right. Stephen King. So what's right. the difference? The difference is at this point in his career, he's so well known. He's, he's very famous. The audience or the reader knows what to expect from him. They mm-hmm. either like it or hate it, but they know what they're going to get. Mm-hmm. They're familiar. Where Rob's sitting by his desk by himself, you have no idea what you're going to pay $19 for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. you might be buying nineteen dollars worth of, you know, fodder for your campfire. You know, right. yeah. <laughs> so and that makes a big difference, doesn't it? I mean, you've kind of sort of got to put yourself out there and and make the effort, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's not it's not an option. It's not optional anymore. And you know, I think a lot of authors, it's a it's painful for them to come to that realization, right? Because mm-hmm. They're like, oh no, like I've, I've literally had authors come to me and they were like, well, how much are you going to invest in my book? I'm like, how much are you going to invest in your book? Yeah, good. I'm like, well, no, this is your job. I'm like, no, you <laughs> need to start paying attention. Like, yeah. it's not that we don't do anything, but so much of this now is so uh, brand driven. Mm-hmm. Yes, by the publisher, but absolutely by the author, 100%. Well, I hate to skip over a couple questions I had in mind, but I feel that it's very important in my show that, you know, let's be honest, you're the star. Mm. Nobody's going to come on here to see me. And I'm it's, sure not, that it's not because I'm not a fascinating guy. It's just because uh, there's so much I don't know, and you seem like such a wealth of knowledge. I want to make sure that you have the opportunity and you can use it in any way that you see fit. Mm-hmm. To speak directly to the audience, and you can talk about upcoming events, your your press, or what they might do if they want to get to know you. Anything. You're not censored in any way. Got uh, it. You know, Zoom just had informed me that there's not a lot of time left, and I want to make sure we fit this in. So I'm going to make an extreme effort to hush. Not always mm-hmm. easy. Mm-hmm. And uh, please, say anything you like to the audience. 
Uh, so first, if you want to find out more about us, just go to runningwildpress.com. Uh, if you're curious about, you know, me as an, an editor and, and speaker and so on, uh, please go to Lisa D. Kastner, K-A-S-T-N-E-R.com. Uh, there you'll find a, a, a bevy of the, our books that are currently available. Uh, please check them out. Um, I love each and every one. I think everyone has just really put their heart and soul into making sure each story is fabulous. And, you know, again, going back to the whole, you know, the very first novel I ever wrote, I was a pantser and it was uh, the biggest piece of crap you would ever see in your entire life. And it's all a learning experience. You know, don't give up when you've got someone who is coming to you and they're like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I've had so many interventions in my own personal career. I, I had uh, an instructor who, he said, this short story is absolutely fabulous. You need to keep writing. This is when I first got back into fiction writing. I think I was in my mid twenties or early twenties. And he said, um, but don't be surprised if it takes you until you're in your, until you're around 50 before you really hit it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to take that, you know, but if you look up some of the most acclaimed authors of our time, many of them didn't even break until they were well past their fifties. Mm -hmm. So, or well past their at least early fifties. So don't, don't give up. If you're in your 20s, if you're in your teens, if you're in your 30s, just keep doing it, right? Everything is a learning experience. And when people give you feedback, listen, both the good and the bad, right? And it's your chance, you know, instead of being reflective or reflect, you know, responsive in that feedback, just to your point, Rod, just shut up, sit down, really absorb it. And figure out if it's something that you want to take seriously, yeah. or is this something that you understood the person's intent, and maybe it's not quite a good fit. Maybe there's another approach, right? There's another way to address what they're looking at you for, right? But again, don't just don't give up, you know. And you you decide what it is that you want to do that will make you happy, whether that is pursuing this as more of a commercial. Uh, aspect and just this is your day job period mm -hmm. it, or you decide if this is going to be something where you know um, it's purely an art form and guess what both ways you're right mm -hmm. any variation within that you are right it is what will make you happy and and don't ever let anyone take that from you so very 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 sound advice mm -hmm. Wonderful, well, wonderful words to share with the audience, really. Uh, I'm and thank sure I'm you, Rod. I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Rod, for creating this, uh, this safe space for people in uh, the storytelling world. Um, I'm sure everyone really, really greatly appreciates it. Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't, I've looked all over the place. I don't know that there's anything really like Relax and Chat where an author can really relax, share their thoughts, share their works, share mm. how they got to where they are, mm. you know, and, and really put themselves out there and say hello to the audience, you know. And I really can't take a whole lot of credit for the success of Relaxing Chat. I've just been blessed with amazing guests, uh, yourself included, believe mm. me. I could well, speak again, with you thank for hours. <laughs> well, th thank you. Again, I, I really think this is a, a, a really, really valuable opportunity for anyone who is checking this out. So, Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm afraid we're running out of time. I, I battle with time constantly. I always have for decades. I've been beaten in so many battles, but I've decided I'll win the war if my novel is on the shelf before, while well, I'm still here to see it. There you go. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to shoot for that. But again, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I think anyone that knows anything about you is aware that your schedule is something else. And to mm -hmm. take the time to do a little show like mine, I am so honored. Thank you very much.
Well, I appreciate being here. Thank you.